Whether you love it or hate it, social media is an important part of building an audience, an important part of releasing music. And in this episode, we're going to talk with Cassie Petrie, a social media expert and CEO of CrowdSurf. So let's get to it. You're listening to the CD Baby. CD Baby. CD Baby. DIY Musician Musician Podcast. Podcast. Hey there, and welcome to episode number 333 of the CD Baby DIY Musician Podcast, where on this episode, you're going to hear our interview with Cassie Petrie, a social media expert. My name is Kevin Bruner, and joining me is Chris Robley. Chris, how are you doing? I'm great. I'm excited for this talk with Cassie because um, I did a webinar panel. I, I moderated a panel, I think it was a month or two ago, uh, and Cassie was one of the one of the speakers, and she was great, super wise, super um just i think has a really fresh attitude towards social and and it's really interesting because i don't know how much name dropping she'll do but she works with some like you know mega artists as well as a whole lot of grassroots diy you know kind of more local emerging artists too so she sort of has the whole spectrum of social media usage for musicians in mind Yeah. And you were on a webinar with her recently and you've already quoted her multiple times. I think you've even quoted her on a past episode of the podcast. Yeah. I think twice actually. Yeah. (laughs) So yeah, that's going to be a great interview coming up. And speaking of social media, uh, you should go and follow CD baby at CD baby. And then you should go follow myself and Chris. I'm at K Bruner and Chris is at Chris Robley. We're both doing some interesting things. And if you click our link in bios, you might find some fun stuff there as well. So yeah, check it out. Follow all those accounts. And um, yeah, we get artists reaching out. And it's sort of like an extension of the podcast where we get to know you a little bit more and can help in, in, in other ways, maybe with a specific issue or question that you have. Feel free to reach out there. Um. And a little bit more housekeeping items. Chris, we announced the DIY Musician VIP Experience. It's coming to Nashville, Tennessee, uh, May 18th through 20th. Very limited tickets. Yes, it's on screen. If you're watching on YouTube, it's on screen right now. Uh, Very limited tickets. We're only selling 300 tickets and we're halfway to being sold out. And we've only been talking about it for like a week and a half. So if you're uh, wanting to go deeper, you want that community experience, you want that learning experience, you want to connect with industry professionals, that's what this event is all about. So head on over to DIYMusicianCon.com to get all the information, but there's, uh, you're going to get access to the Music Biz Conference, the last day of the Music Biz Conference, which is all artist-focused content. Then we have a day two at a different location that's going to be about small group mentoring, more sessions and networking and really making that connection and uh, feeling like, you know, you were heard and got some advice for your specific situation. And then if you want to stay for Saturday, there's an additional $30 ticket for Tom Jackson's four hour live performance uh, workshop that is going to be amazing, worth the extra 30 bucks. And that the, one, just, just to interrupt, like, that one is tailored to like solo performers or s- very small groups, as opposed to normally his thing is working with, you know, four or five piece band. So yeah, it's going to be where a lot of artists that like they see the live band makeover and they're like, that's awesome. But I end up playing by myself or a, a duo or a trio in smaller venues without the lights and production. And that doesn't mean you can't have an amazing show. And I think uh, I've seen this four hour workshop before I've been a part of it, Uh, but I've also, uh, he's done like an hour and a half version at our conference before. And it's still amazing to see the dramatic difference between someone sitting there playing a song, a great song with an acoustic guitar and what Tom does with them to make it more impactful. And he's going to be pulling people up out of the audience. So you might get to be on stage for that. The main ticket is $149. And uh, then that extra buy on for Tom Jackson's 30 bucks, but musiciancon.com. It's going to sell out fast. And uh, that's going to be a fun one. Nashville. Heck yeah. May while music biz is going on. uh, All the industry people are there. 
Nashville is just always a buzz at that time. So it's a big event and uh, the, the, the music biz is a big event and the whole week feels like a big event. We're keeping it small to make it VIP. And you can see on the website all the reasons why we're calling it VIP experience. So head on over there. If you're hearing this and you're thinking, I want to go, but maybe I'll wait till next week. You may not get a ticket. So go buy your ticket now. And what else, Chris? Anything else before we jump in to the podcast? I don't, let's see. Oh, uh, we do have a new series going on YouTube right now. Uh, it's called Top 5 Tips, and it's a lot of CD Baby artists who are doing really cool things in their career. Uh, they tend to be sort of like, uh, you know, on the indie side of things, sort of industry leaders in a particular aspect. So, for instance, Emma McGann has her Top 5 live streaming tips because she's a professional live streamer. There's other people talking about songwriting, uh, TikTok, production, you know, you name it. I think there's nine episodes so far, but we've got dozens in the works. So check out that YouTube playlist. It's really cool. Yeah, it's it's artists that are doing cool stuff. It's for the, es the essence of what we started this podcast around, like we want to hear what our other artists are doing and in certain areas where they're being successful and learn from them. So check that out. That's a good one. All right. Well, I think we got all the housekeeping items out of the way. Let's head into our interview with Cassie. Well, joining us on the podcast is Cassie Petrie, co-founder and co-CEO of CrowdSurf, social media expert. And uh, we're, we're excited to have you, Cassie. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah. So uh, you, you actually had a very timely post on Instagram this morning just talking about your your history and how you got into the music business. So why don't we start out with with hearing a little bit about your background? You can tell us about your company, and then Chris and I have a bunch of questions for you that we'll dive into. Awesome. So I think it's always hard for people in music to pinpoint the exact moment that started their career. A lot of times, I think it's when people are young, when they're learning how to play an instrument or other sort of you know, childhood moments. I would say mine wasn't childhood, childhood, but came a little bit later when I was 11 years old and I saw my first Backstreet Boys concert. And I had not seen a concert up until that point in my life. And to be quite honest, I was pretty unfamiliar with music because nobody in my family is musical. Nobody can sing. Nobody plays an instrument. And not that they don't dislike music, but it's not an infinity of my family by any means. They're all engineers and nurses and careers in that lane. And the only reason I went to a Backstreet Boys concert was actually not because I sought to go to a Backstreet Boys concert. It was because my softball team won the league and our prize for winning the league was box seats at a Backstreet Boys concert, which I would like kill for that now. But then I was just kind of like, whatever. Um, <laughs> and I went and that at that moment changed my life. I loved, you know, I was familiar with them. Of course, they were unavoidable at that, you know, when I was 11 and 12, this is like 1999 ish era. Or, yeah. 1998, 1999. They were unavoidable at that point. Yes. Um, but I wasn't like a fan fan, but seeing the experience of people enjoying them all together live was so cool. And I've never really turned back since after that, I, started becoming a fangirl of them. I opened a Backstreet Boys fanzine on AOL because AOL just come like it kind of was coming into the scene at this point. And I wanted to figure out a way to express my love and adoration and connect with other fans. So, you know, now you would probably have a TikTok account or an Instagram or Twitter. At that point, those didn't exist. So I had an AOL email list that I connected with other people on. And um, I also built like a very base level website. I bought a book on coding HTML and made a little website about them and really enjoyed the digital experience of being a fan as much as the the physical. And I would say that that was like the first building block and then building blocks came after that. I became fans of other artists. My fandom with Backstreet Boys progressed. I started traveling to go see them. Um, I sort of I don't want to say tricked my family into, you know, because I, I wasn't 16. I couldn't drive. Um, and so, but I wanted to see them more than once, like in the city or the city closest to me. 
And so the deal my family members made with me, they're like, if you pay for it, you can go being like, yeah, this child will not be able to figure out how to pay to see the Baxter Boys in Chicago, Atlanta, that sort of thing. But what I did was I opened an eBay business selling my concert photos. Because <laughs> at that time, th that time wow. you didn't, at that time, like photos didn't really upload to the internet the same way they do now. Mm -hmm. So you, so you could sell printed pictures on eBay. So I did that. And that funded my <laughs> trips to other concerts because I would be like, okay, I paid for it. Here are the tickets I got. Here's our hotel. Here's gas money. I calculated it this way. So I would like present my little mini touring budget is what I call it. Cause that, that, that process is actually kind of similar to how you build bigger tour budgets, which is hilarious to think about. Um, but it really is, they really are similar. And I feel like I learned how to tour from, you know, making my little budgets to go see <laughs> concerts. Um, and, you know, I, I was enjoying that experience. And then I remember my uncle told me one day, he's like, you know, there's programs where you study, you know, not being the person on stage because I knew I was never going to be that. I have zero music talent in that sense. But he's like, there's people that aren't on stage that work in music. And that's, that was like my aha moment. And I, from that point on, became obsessed with the idea of working in the music business. At that time, I didn't know exactly what I was going to do or what I wanted to do. I just wanted to do really anything. And the number one thing I read everywhere, and there wasn't a lot of places to read at this point because Google wasn't what it was now we weren't taught you know we didn't have all this information at our fingertips the way that we do now um so i had limited resources but the resources i read talked about how competitive the music business was and that terrified me so i think i actually ended up overcompensating and found everything i could do in louisville kentucky to build my resume i volunteered to work with local bands. I was running their peer volume pages. That was what was the thing at the time, uh, pre-MySpace. And um, I was helping with their email list and helping do other like research tasks that them or their managers needed. I found local record labels, record stores. And then I would also street team for national acts, but at a local level. So like putting up flyers at stores and that sort of thing. I just wanted to learn everything I could and get as much experience as possible because I wanted to increase my odds of being able to get a job in the music business. And I always say to people, if you don't know where to start, all local bands need help. So there's, a, there's always a local artist that could probably use digital marketing help, help marketing their shows. There's always a local artist that needs help that doesn't have a full team yet. If you don't know where to start, start local. Um, so I did that, built a resume, and I got a job as, uh, as my in my freshman year as um, a college rep at Middle Tennessee State University with Warner Music Group. They usually don't take people until your second part of college, but they said my resume was so good, and I was like, yes, I did a good job. So my resume was so strong, and I showed a lot of interest, so they brought me on. Um, so I started as a college rep freshman year, and around the same time as when MySpace sort of made its way into the world and I was at college and I would saw a couple of local artists it always comes back to local artists for me in a lot of situations and I saw a lot of local artists using MySpace to market their show and then they would put like their MySpace username at the bottom of their flyers and I went to my boss and like why don't Warner artists do this why don't like big artists use MySpace why is it just the ones I see at my college and she was kind of like listen I don't really know what that means exactly but <laughs> pick, but pick an, and I'm glad that she was open-minded because that could have changed my career course she, she was like I don't really know what that means but pick an artist and run their MySpace page and so I did and I, I did really well at it they be, went to number one like on the, MySpace had like little daily charts they went to number one on the chart I grew their audience pretty fast I was doing a really good job and other people and Warner Music Group heard about it. So they connected me with the head of new media at the time. This was in 2004 in um, Nashville at the Nashville label. And she wanted to hire me. So I moved from college rep to digital marketing assistant, MySpace, temp, whatever. I was just a temp for this person. And I did that for three years. And digital grew at that time, but it still wasn't like important enough to have non-temp jobs <laughs> so <laughs> um, there wasn't like social media manager there wasn't 
there wasn't uh there wasn't a job for me to grow into and there are other jobs I could take but I actually I, I liked what I was doing I but and I thought that it would eventually become worth more money and I was graduating college and I wanted to I wanted a big girl job and the only way to have a big girl job was to start my own company because the job I wanted did not exist. So this was almost 16 years ago. Um, me and my business partner were in similar situations. We started CrowdSurf in 2007 and we've evolved a lot. Um, it's changed a lot since we started, but I think the core ethos of what we do is the same, which is we want to, we artists were very important to us growing up and we want to help artists connect with their audiences, build audiences and do cool things for their fans. And something that's become more of importance to us recently is how do we, how do we make them less stressed about this digital monster that exists now? Because it's so intense. When I started, nobody really cared about it. I was begging people like, please just let me set up a MySpace page for you, please. And they were like, I don't know what that is, but sure. <laughs> and, sometimes. and now artists would kill to have someone else managing this stuff. For them. <laughs> yeah. I was like begging. I was like, please, Luke <laughs> Bryan, let me set up Twitter for you. <laughs> and, and, you know, I think somebody from management eventually said yes. Um, but it, it's, it took a long time to convince people to even like get on these platforms and now it's so different. A lot of times, you know, I was begging for content and now I'm like, sometimes I'm almost overwhelmed with content. People are chasing me for stuff versus chasing them. It's, it, it, it's really evolved, but it's cool to have seen it since, you know, kind of do that 180. Cause I remember when I would sit in those record label meetings and digital will be kind of the little last thing on the agenda item. And it wouldn't get, you know, you wouldn't even get to it when I was at Warner sometimes. And now it's, very much okay what's digital doing and that'll determine when the song's released <laughs> it's, it's really become very very 180 i have uh some questions about sort of your current services and stuff but i just want to say two things about your backstory i love the fact that your music adventures began with sports oh uh, yeah <laughs> that's great and then also i'd never heard of anyone touring with backstreet boys like i i was used to like oh dave matthews or fish or grateful Dead. Like, you know, <laughs> people going on tour with those bands but that's great. Backstreet I actually went to Dave. I I, I kind of went 180 after Backstreet. I did had a Dave Matthews moment phase. Okay. Yeah, but it was I was I was 15, 16. My I, my other friend was 16, so we would drive to go see them because my family was sick of driving me at that point. They're like, I don't care if it's unsafe. <laughs> you drive yourself. But I remember how hard it was to um, get hotel rooms because we weren't 18. <laughs> So we would like stay at campgrounds and stuff. We would go see Dave Matthews because that was the only way we would have a place to stay. Huh. That's awesome. Oh, uh, <laughs> so the the thing I wanted to ask you about your current services, I know you work with both like artists that everyone will know their names, you know, big artists as well as indie artists. And so like, what are you doing? What are the breadths of your kind of the ways you're helping them? And then also, is there much of a difference between what they need and what success sort of looks like? depending on their stature, like does an indie artist need something completely different from some of the major ones you're working with? I mean, there's definitely differences and I would say both level and also genre audience, you know, artist sophistication level and interest in social media. But a lot of the core things I would say, I would say stay the same, I, you know, something we, I think offered a lot of people's like organization and planning. So making sure that you have a login doc, making sure that all the passwords are secure and that you know your situation for two factor, making sure that you're remembering to post. Um, I know those sound basic, but I think that that's a big value that we provide to people is kind of like, it's kind of like, you know, how people have personal trainers or other coaches in their life. I would say we're kind of a coach in a sense. We're like, Making sure you show up to practice, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. um, the accountability. Sure team. Yeah. Yeah. So accountability is a big part of it. And then I think a lot of it, and this is the same for big artists and indie artists and everything in between is brainstorming. So like we have an idea, we come up with ideas, we bounce those off artists, artists have ideas. They ask us if they're, you know, if they're good or not, how they execute them, or they'll send us a video to help edit it for TikTok. Um, 
that sort of thing. So I'd say a lot of those core things are the same. I would say where, you know, it gets where there's some big differences in terms of, you know, household name artists, let's call it that. There's just a lot of little boxes to check to make sure that it, when they have a release or a tour announce or anything that's an announcement, there's so many admin things to do in boxes to check because information about that artist populates in so many places. So mm -hmm. really sort of the checkpoint on making sure that that gets populated everywhere on independent artists that there's not, or not independent artists on smaller artists. Cause there's, you know, independent artists, not independent artists, but that they're, you know, at a similar level where they're not necessarily having information curated at the speed of light everywhere across the internet. I think a lot of our job becomes how do we make sure that there's more of this artist being curated in more places so that one day that, that they have this problem of the household name artist. Um, so how are there, how is their name music information being populated in more places? Yeah. You, you describe a, a problem that I think, I, I think a lot of artists get frustrated with and probably stifles a lot of their, social media efforts and just marketing efforts in general that, you know, Chris, Chris made a crack about wishing MySpace was the place. I mean, there's so much, so many places to manage and also that the platforms are just evolving so quickly. I think a lot of times artists just feel like I can't write and record and be an artist and go out on tour and be an expert on all these platforms. I just give up. It's too much. It is. It's, it's a lot to expect. And when I started, there wasn't the like time commitment expectation that there is now of, of artists. And you have to use really different parts of your brain. Even for me, like where this is my job, it's hard for me to go from creative mode to admin mode. So I can't imagine like the drastic difference a lot of artists feel between having to like be vulnerable and emotional and create music and then be like, okay, here's my checklist. And I need to make sure that I, you know, posted on all these things today. Like it's just so two different mindsets that probably take like four different four hours to like shift between <laughs> in your brain. Like, cause I, it's hard for me too. And I'm not writing music. So I, I completely empathize with that problem. It's, it's really, really tough and you have to be really disciplined to stay on top of it. I'm curious. I mean, that sort of overwhelm is definitely a common challenge. I feel like most artists who are taking it seriously face, but like, if you had to identify like the biggest problem that is, uh, that I suppose that faces more the in independent DIY emerging artist, like what's their biggest challenge on average? I would say the biggest overall like psychological concept that I'm addressing with people is them posting because they feel like they have to, not because they want to. And when you're posting because you have to, the content generally is not that good. Um, it's, so it's tough because they're saying, you know, all these gatekeepers, whether it's labels, DSPs, the social platforms themselves are saying, you need to, you know, you're not eligible for this program. You're not eligible to get signed. You're not eligible for all these things if you don't have these numbers. So of course it's going to be a focus for them. But I think that, that pressure is, I don't know, created a, an unwinnable situation. Um, so a lot of times I'm kind of like being like, listen, you, you gotta, you gotta reframe what content is in your head because this pleasing gatekeepers thing, that's not, that's not going to create content that people connect with. Mm -hmm. I was going to ask you if, if there was a common mindset or characteristic in the artists you see succeeding. And I suppose, following up on what you just said, I'm curious, the people who are more just sort of naturally inclined to being uh, vulnerable, charismatic, creative in that video, social video sense, like, do they have an outsized advantage or, or are there ways that you coach people who are averse or, you know, that other thing you described are just like, I don't want to have to do this. Like, is there hope for them? I guess that's what I'm, that's what I'm really asking. <laughs> is there hope for you? <laughs> no, th I think there is. Cause I, I feel, I think a lot of artists who don't want to be talking to camera feel like there isn't hope for them. And I, I, I do think there, there is hope for them. The, the artist I see winning, and this is going to sound really simple, but I really believe in it 
are people who just get up every day and be an artist. They continue even if their last post didn't do well, even if their last song didn't do well, even if their last tour didn't do well. They just continue to wake up every day. And I don't want to say forget about that stuff. You you're obviously can't forget about it. You're obviously going to learn from it. But just get up every day and be the best artist you can be. And I think that eventually wins. Um, you know, I think a good example is um, we worked with Kim Petras uh, up and you know up until basically she got signed to her major label. But when she started with, she was on a wall. Started with two thousand Instagram followers, and she really didn't have a vision for for social media. And um, was you know now she's um, amazing at it, and she found her voice, and she's really comfortable with it. But it didn't happen overnight. She didn't start as that artist. She built to being that artist. But there's a lot of best practices on social media she doesn't follow or didn't follow you know according to other people's standards i think she's always been kim and did what kim wanted to do and i think that was the right thing to do but kim just woke up every day kept being kim she kept releasing songs she kept being an artist and she had her moment with unholy the right break happened but she just kept releasing kept touring kept creating kept being an artist and that eventually led to her winning a Grammy and that's awesome, but it didn't happen overnight. And she didn't start off by being good at social media. It was a journey and you just have to keep trying and keep evolving your journey. And, you know, it's okay to try post and not work. You just, the most important thing is to not give up and to not lose momentum. Yeah. I think there's, I think there's several things that artists struggle with and maybe you could, you could give us uh maybe some guidelines or maybe how you would go around strategizing for this artist. You have the artist, like you mentioned, where it's kind of like, I just want to be the artist over here. And, you know, it, maybe it's time consuming, but you know, what Chris just mentioned, I think a lot of artists, like maybe when blogging was the thing, they felt like this is my moment. I'm great at writing or like a platform like Twitter, but now everything is so video focused, so quick bite size and, feels like an instant supposed to have some sort of instant gratification that a lot of artists, it's not even a matter of time or effort. They just feel lost because they don't feel like that resonates with not even just who they are, but their skill set. And how do you help an artist define a strategy around like these platforms? Because it is important. It's a commun communication channel. Um, but when maybe they're, they're a very talented artist, they have so much potential but the the mode of communication is just more of a challenge for them. It, it is. And I actually compare this moment that we're having with TikTok and other sh short form vertical content is what I call it to I fit, I wasn't alive when this happened. But I imagine that there's some similarities to when MTV came on board. Why do I have to make a video now? Why are there music videos? Why can't it just be audio? Why, like why? why can I just make music and not have to have a visual attached to it? People are supposed to have their own visuals attached to it in their head when they hear it. Um, but, you know, what happens over time is that new inventions happen, new hardware comes onto the market. And as television became more popular, music had to figure out how to adapt to television. And so what's happening right now is we're having to adapt music to the mobile phone and all the amazing features that are on it. So it's a very, you know, similar moment to, I think that moment. Um, and it, you know, I really, you really have to kind of, you know, sit back and sort of reframe if you're having trouble with it and not loving TikTok culture or social media culture right now, I think of a good way to sort of sit back and look at it is think, okay, Let's take the logos. Let's take the content populated off of it. You know, let's really think about this. This platform is a video platform. It, it, it distributes videos. What video do I want to put on it? What does my video content look like? You know, that I think that can kind of, re, that helps reframe it with people sometimes. Um, but it, at the core, it's, it's just a way that you share videos with people and people can comment on them and share them. But that's all... TikTok is it's 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 videos and there you know sometimes a, a photo gallery in a video but it's it's videos that's that's what 
it is at the end of the day. And I think sometimes kind of thinking about it that way can take the pressure out of what you make for it. It's funny because I'm, this is probably more true with hindsight, but, and maybe because I'm getting older now, but like <laughs> the adoption of MySpace, the adoption of Facebook and Twitter and YouTube, you know, they were hurdles, of course, but they felt very sort of, I don't know, like some natural extension in some way or, or just easy to grasp. And then I felt like with TikTok and Reels and stuff and Snapchat, it, it, it really suddenly felt like something new and different or that something that asks something different of the artist. Uh, and, and again, maybe that's just cause I'm older than I was when I embraced my space, but um, I don't know. It's just interesting to me. Yeah. Well, cause we're having to produce like, you know, before we would just make content and make music videos and maybe take some pictures. And now we're having to populate a new type of video content more frequently. So yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's a whole, another product offering that didn't exist before. So I, I do see why it's, you know, different and overwhelming for people. Well, I think one of the things about these platforms now, uh, while it is just video, I think there's this thing of balancing, well, what's actually going to work on that platform compared to the amount of time I put into it. So like looking at when YouTube was emerging, you could park any sort of video there and your followers would see it. Now it's like, if you don't make the right kind of video, which may or may not fall into my lane of expertise or comfort or whatever, it might just feel like wasted effort. I, and I think that's where a lot of artists struggle. And these platforms change, that changes so quickly where, you know, I loved Instagram and used it all the time, still do. And then suddenly everything I was posting on the feed was no longer being seen. It was all video. And I'm like, but I love I have a photo background. I love cool photos and really curated this. In yeah. Life. But that's all out the window. <laughs> and having yeah. to really switch mindset to like, okay, now reels, if you're not engaging with reels, this platform may not be as useful. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Instagram was, I mean, the name itself, like it was made about photos and now it's not about photos really anymore. Photos are oftentimes one of the least engaging type of content on Instagram. And yeah, it can be really discouraging when you make a piece of content that you're really proud of and you feel really good about and it performs, you know, in the bottom 25% of your content like that. That's really tough and it's really hard to stay motivated to keep doing it. But I think the people who, you know, I don't want to say they didn't, didn't let those numbers bother them. I'm sure numbers bother most people at one point or another in their mm -hmm. career. But the people who keep going, even if it does bother them, I, I think it all comes down to discipline and continuing to put yourself out there every day. Just like I said, keeping an artist, keep posting. You don't have to post every day, but make sure that you're sharing often when you, as long as you have something meaningful and interesting to share, just keep doing it. And I think you eventually have your moment. It, it, I really, the people that I see have their moment, they didn't have it. I mean, there was a few people that had it right away, of course, but most people didn't have it right away. They had, they, they posted for months or a year or years until something caught that made sense or got them a record deal or got them a viral song or whatever the moment they had is. But the people, you have to keep showing up and buying your lottery ticket every day, so to speak. Um, that's how I look at it. I'm curious, like as you're uh, brainstorming or, or helping artists shape a campaign or a strategy, um, how it may impact uh, the way those things take shape uh, based on like, uh, how do I ask this? Like where the person is at in their career, I imagine there's like a time where the priority is going to be like maximum reach. And then there's probably a time where it's like, hey, we've got a sizable audience. How do we get those people to, you know, get off platform or do something else? And then maybe there's a time where it's like, We've got all the net name recognition in the world. How do we use this to like drive sales and actually make money? Like, so is that true? And if so, how does that affect the way you shape strategy? Yeah. And this is a conversation we actually have with our clients is what, what do you want out of this? Are you trying, do you want bigger numbers? Are you trying to sell tickets? Are you trying to market a single? And usually it's a combination of all of those, but different people, you know, would prioritize, you know, different things in different orders if they had to. And 
you know, I prefer, I think the projects that really just want numbers, those ones are tough for me. And sometimes I'll even stray away from those because I don't think social media numbers always equates to like music industry success. So I, I'm reluctant about a lot of those types of, of projects. And I get scared when somebody's like, I want to get to a hundred thousand followers as fast, fast as possible. And I'm like, listen, I understand why, because you want to be more competitive for, you know, brand opportunities, deal opportunities, opener opportunities, that sort of thing. But if your goal is like numbers and recognition over releasing music or selling tickets and performing live, like I don't think we're going to be on the same page about marketing strategy. Um, I prefer projects who kind of have like the other goals we talked about. Ticket sales, building relationships with audience, building... um you know, building a fan base that's excited for their their releases. Th those are the the projects that I'm more interested in because numbers. There's yes, there are ways you can get numbers, but again, numbers don't always equate to these other things that I think are more important in the grand scheme of things. It sounds like maybe having those uh, priorities that are most tied to the music itself, like maybe those people are a little more grounded, or some, or the content yeah. more grounded in the artistry. I think the content ends up being better if your goals are not numbers. <laughs> That's what I, I truly, huh. because you can become, if your goal is to like be TikTok famous, you can, if you try really hard and study and put a budget behind boosting your accounts, like you can probably achieve the numbers to, to do that. But what's the point you want attention? Like that's, that's, if somebody just wants attention that I don't, that's not, the business I want to be in of like helping people get attention for the sake of getting attention. That's not, not very fun for me, if I'm being honest. <laughs> well, I think that is something that I, I think is a good question that even on a recent episode of the podcast, Chris and I were discussing, it's like with these platforms, it's easy for artists to maybe even be led astray from without having like firm goals and understanding what they're trying to accomplish that, suddenly they just get in this thing. Wait, all I'm doing is trying to get attention for myself that has nothing to do with building a music career. It's just for attention's sake. And, uh, you know, like TikTok, I think is very good at, uh, Roping leading people, people. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> leading people down that path and it can be fun and entertaining. And there's, you know, on one hand, if that's what you want to do, go ahead, go for it. But the idea of like really trying to focus in on like, how am I using this to build my career? Um, one, one question I have for you is like, so when you're working with an artist, what are some of the things that you do to under, kind of unearth those content ideas for a particular artist that, that will be valuable? You know, you have, I'm sure, artists of all different sizes and shapes coming to you with different points in their career. And what are some of the processes you go through to help them identify what will work for them? So Helen from my team actually came up with this question, and I use it all the time now. It's what do you hate most about logging onto your social media right now? That's a really good identifier to like what they need help with. Like what stresses you out? What do you not like? What types of content do you hate that artists are doing that you always see in your feed? Knowing that is can really help us like dictate some good ideas for them. Cause we immediately know like what their stressors are. And one of the reasons I think a lot of people hire us is to, hopefully make them a little, you know, a little less stressed. We're not going to be able to eliminate stress of social media. That's, you know, that's, you know, I think beyond our reach at this point, but we do want to make it easier. So knowing what people feel is hard can mm -hmm. be a really good starting point for that. Hmm. Yeah. You'd mentioned budget uh, earlier, and I'm assuming if they've enlisted you, they have a budget at least for your expertise. Uh, does that... Does that come with sort of um, a requisite ad spend budget? Like, is that part of your kind of your deal? Like, you, you'll I'll help you, but also you got to be spending on social ads. Um, most of our clients actually don't spend on social ads. Some do, oh. we, and we have a, we have a team member who's focused on advertising, but advertising can be a dangerous hole to go down if not correctly. And if you're just spending against every post you make, it's like if you do a post without the spend, it's like, it's almost, you become like an addict and you have to like spend to hit the numbers of the other posts. It's a, uh, it's tricky. 
And they know you're an addict, so they're less likely (laughs) to share it with anyone. So you'll pay again. That's always my concern. I I struggle with this because I listen, I don't I haven't done a study, I don't have evidence, but I've heard a lot of people say that they feel like once they boosted on TikTok, that their numbers were never the same again after, like from organic reach. You know, and I don't have evidence of that. And it could just be coincidence, but I know a lot of people are scared of it and, and feel that way. Actually, I've been posting videos of just stuff to help artists on TikTok and I tried boosting and boosted a couple and then I, I felt like that was real yeah I was getting some traction I'm like oh these are starting to really pick up in the algorithm then I started boosting and it seemed like after that point I went back down and so punished you for your ambition I I, I mean and I've seen that I wouldn't say that like in older social media platforms I don't see that as much anymore but I've seen that over the years too like the same thing it's interesting the all the social media platforms advertising systems have they evolve in sort of a similar pattern. It's a, uh, it, you know, as they become more mature, there's more options and it becomes more leveled out. But something that's, you know, really interesting about where TikTok is, is there's the good thing about advertising on there is you can get a really good ROI and you can get a larger reach per dollar you spend in most cases, but the tools aren't as robust. And I'm seeing some people kind of have this not you know if we if you don't spend your organic reach became lower issue so it but um it's but i i, I saw this when um like instagram and facebook first started advertising a similar issue and i i don't see that as much anymore but i've you see the the sort of similar patterns repeat as new platforms come to power yeah. i thought i to i would agree with what you said about i found like the roi was great yeah, and, and TikTok's like, we've got a sucker here. We don't have yeah. to. We don't have to push his content anymore. He'll pay. <laughs> oh, one question I've been wanting to ask you is, um, I have quoted you, I think, four or five times in the last month. It's about your um, emphasis on changing the way artists think about what an official release is, and kind of leading with the with the tease and the collaboration, and sort of ending with the release. Do you want to talk about? that shift in mindset yeah i i just think release timelines have shifted a lot with the sort of having the prevalence of of a clip that's on vertical or on like tiktok and other platforms so early and something we've talked about internally at our in our marketing meetings at the company is we've kind of have to adjust our timelines and some i think that's think sort of the arc of a release has changed a little bit and you kind of build to a tease now almost the same way you used to build to a release and i feel like the actual full release of the song is almost like a remix or the deluxe version <laughs> of the, the the clip release but um the you know the tease or the clip that you know the tease is what we used to look at it but i, I just call it like you know the clip drop or whatever you want to call it is so important now that it's you kind of build your timeline off of when that song is first going to be available for everyone to hear, even if it's not the the full song, but it's uh, really a lot of people really shifting their timelines, best practices, pre-saves, how you push a pre-save and all of that kind of stuff. Yeah. Cause like 20 years ago, Metallica was literally like suing people for sharing like any shred of the music before it was officially (laughs) out. And now it's the exact opposite. Like everyone's like, how do we, how do we share the demo? How do we ask the art, uh, ask the audience if we should even go into the studio and record this? It's like there's this weird participation almost at every step in the the, the building of the song. Yeah, you know, and I think that you can still do it the other way too, but you just kind of you kind of have to have a plan for it. I think is what I, one of the points I'm sort of making with this timeline thing is like you have to know when your big moment is where people hear that thing for the first time, whether it's the clip or the full song. You got to build out your plan around that. And I think for a lot of larger artists, it makes sense to not have the clip and just go straight into full song. Um, but it, you know, there's, there's a lot of, a lot of different ways to do it these days. Which I like what fun. you just said that you, you have to know what's the big moment. And I think that's probably where a lot of artists struggle. They just start putting stuff out and don't even realize which what where the where's the moment the fans are supposed to care the most or get excited the most yep. and really capitalize on it? Is it hey I'm gonna preview it and then this thing's gonna be taken off and we're gonna just have a lot of fun as I go through the recording process and we're gonna make this happen or is it 
surprise, it's here. This is it. Go to Spotify. Like, when is that big moment? Yeah, it's all about just having a plan. Um, and the plan can be done a lot of different ways, but you need to have a plan so that you know your plan will kind of dictate. It'll help actually alleviate the stress you have about what to post on social media. If you have a plan on what your big moments are, it's kind of easier to think about what pieces of content you create to support those moments. Um, I think I asked you this in that webinar we did a, a month or two ago. I was looking for the gossip here. Uh, <laughs> is there much of a distinction between, let's say, the the emerging lesser known artists, younger artists, uh, and the more established ones on how willing they are to just pick up the phone and create some TikToks? Like, is it like pulling teeth with the, um, you know, the legacy artists, let's say? Um, it's interesting. Like sometimes it can be, sometimes some of them are more into it than I want them to be. And I'm like, okay, you're too excited, but like, you're bad at it. So like, let's reel this in a little bit. <laughs> uh, like, right. Slow down, slow down. <laughs> slow down. Like let's, let's, you know, you like those, I'll get like a drop box with like a hundred different things. And then I'm like, okay, we got, we got to figure this out. We got to, we got to get you, we got to, you know, teach you about, you know, um, how to not have, something backlit you know stuff like that um <laughs> we need to make your content shittier yeah, yeah. <laughs> so so there's um there's that and then but there's some developing artists where that's really hard too um so i would say that there's it's really you know it could be like pulling teeth at any stage dependent upon <laughs> their personality and the and the and the artist um and then sometimes i feel like too that it's pulling teeth pulling teeth pulling teeth and then one day it, it just clicks like you just yeah. find there's finally like enough evidence or they finally figured out how to have fun with it or they finally had a TikTok be successful and they get it now, whatever it is, there's a moment where it just like clicks for people too. Mm -hmm. And that's always really fun. Um, but it's, uh, you know, you can help do some things to help make it click. You can, you know, I think the big thing is how to make it like more fun. Like how, how is this not stressful? How is this more interesting? How do you find something that they would be excited to participate in versus again, feeling like it's, it's a chore, but yeah, pulling teeth at all levels. Doesn't matter how big or, how big or small of an artist you are. That's comforting somehow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're all just terrible at it. That's what she's yeah. saying. <laughs> oh, well, one other thing I'm curious about is it, when you're helping artists, come up with a strategy, content ideas, whatever it is. Um, how much emphasis are you putting on uh, creating content that intentionally keeps people on the platform? So that could be like getting people to make things that intentionally drive repeat views or that loop or that get people in the comment section, duets, any of those sorts of things that just drive up watch time. I mean, there's definitely things that here or there that we can do you know, I would say like the optimization part, a lot of times we're telling the artist or the talent, like, Hey, you know, just make stuff you like, and we'll think about what, you know, those sort of things are that could be added. Like, do we edit it a different way? Do we caption it this way? Do we put the text caption in the video this way? You know, de definitely thinking about little tricks here and there, but I find that if you get too caught up in thinking about the tricks while you're creating it again it sort of goes into that weird like doing something because you have to versus mm. wanting to and it doesn't you know always turn out as good as i would like for it to so what are some of the the ideas or strategies that you've worked on in order to like you know you mentioned the goal might be to sell tickets or you know uh we keep hearing about tiktok potentially getting banned in the u.s like how what are what are things that you've done with artists to potentially turn that social audience into maybe an email address or a ticket sale? How, what have you seen that's working in those areas? Um, I think figuring out organic ways to talk about the things you're doing in real life and having things to do in real life. There's some, um, you know, on tour marketing on TikTok, for example, one I don't know when this will be rolled out to everyone, but there is like a little ticket master button now. And that's been a really awesome, like it's just a little button. that's like an overlay on mm -hmm. TikToks. Really awesome driver for ticket sales. I hope that that rolls out to everyone in some capacity soon, but that's been really, really helpful. Um, we've had some success in terms of like integrating the tour 
ad bad at the end of some videos for people or adding text tour dates over top of like a live performance clip. That's been really um, successful too. It's like, we're always trying different things to see like what, what converts, but I will say that we're definitely selling TikToks off of, or de- not selling TikTok, selling tickets off of TikTok and Instagram by using these sort of tactics. So including tour dates, not just in the caption, but like actually in text over like performance videos has worked mm-hmm. really well. Um, uh, st- or still of the ad mat at the end. Um, but that's my, that's always my number one goal. If somebody's on tour. I want them to come to the show because that's like the ultimate connection they're going to have with, with an artist. And we're fortunately seeing conversion on these strategies, which is really, really awesome. Um, but it, just in, another thing in general, like, especially, you know, you hear about the looming TikTok ban. I don't get too caught up about it. Cause what can I do about it? If it happens, nothing. I think the best thing you can do, and I would have this advice, even if there wasn't a TikTok ban is don't put all your eggs in one basket. Make sure you're on platforms where your audience is. There's a lot of cool places to be and, and always use uh, platforms early on. Like right now, I think our, or being an early adopter can really pay off. Um, the tools that you can early adopt right now are, are Instagram broadcasts. Most people don't have that tool now, The you know the, where you can send a DM to everyone who's subscribed to your broadcast list. I think that's a really great tool. I haven't seen an artist like own yet that I think you really can. Um, and then also Spotify clips They're you know, of course they're introducing vertical video. Um, they're starting to roll that out in beta testing, but as soon as you have access to utilize Spotify clips, use it because not everyone is using it yet. And when somebody's not using or when everybody's not using something yet, that is the best time to gain audience and traction on it. Yeah, I thought, that, <clears throat> excuse me, I thought it was interesting in that uh, clips roll out how they, they sort of framed it as an anti TikTok vertical video thing. <laughs> I don't know if you noticed, it was like, this yes, is a, not about memes and trends. This is about the, the spotlight on your music and your artistry. Yeah, I mean, like, you can keep all that trash on TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> Even though essentially it's the same exact thing. They're just, you know, it's the same tool. It's short form vertical content. You could populate your TikTok the same way they're suggesting it. It's just a strategy, not a tool difference. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, I had a question about um, over all the campaigns you've run. Um, are there ones that were surprise successes and then also surprise failure? You're like, you're like, this is going to work. And then it flops and then vice versa. This will never work. And it's a smash hit. Yeah. Um, one of my, and this was one I was kind of like adjacently involved with. Um, I was another team at the company, but um, we had an artist. I'm not going to name her because that would be mean, but <laughs> there was an artist that from my standards had like horrible single cut, like, art like horrible graphics horrible everything and we would we would do our job and suggest changes on everything and she'd just be like no i want it this way and i want this single cover i want this out that and it's like okay and it's surprisingly i think it did really well because people like knew it was her like uh, people responded to this aesthetic way better than i ever thought they would because from like my music industry standards i was like i don't like this and i think this like looks horrible and i think most people who know graphic design would agree but for some reason it just worked because i guess it was it was her and it was authentic and organic and at some point i like i watched it for like two singles and then i told the team i'm like just let her keep doing it it seems to be working like i'm and i like became like fascinated by watching this sort of bizarre like low quality release strategy thing work um <laughs> i don't know it was it was oh. really interesting i never really seen anything like it and uh, i had a I had a really good time watching it and learning from it if I'm being honest. I, I like i like that description low quality release strategy <laughs> yeah it was like it, it, it's like it, i was like I, just admin this and like beat into it um because it whatever she's like her aesthetic's working for some reason so and she she's fighting for it so she likes it so i mean it's not my first choice but let's let's roll with it (laughs) yeah so that's um that's one that um you know kind of surprised me but i like i i liked being wrong it was fun i liked watching the bad graphics um (laughs) that's a more that side of it's a happier accident than the flip one which i'll hope you'll say too where you're like this there's no way this won't succeed 
And then uh, I mean, I'm, I mean, I think when I was younger, I th- thought, you know, that we would front load things that would be for sure. They'd be a win and they weren't. So I, I don't have that expectation mm. anymore. In fact, I think I'm almost like a little fearful of over marketing. Um, yeah. I think that, I think the big thing I like to think about to not ha- like sort of have that moment where like, this is going to go, there's no way it's not is um, I'd like to have sort of a, a, a long plan for, I like kind of pre-release release week, you know, when the, and then I call sustain, but like what happens after the song is out? Because a lot of times songs don't go for a while they, or they don't go until the sustain, you know, psych part of the cycle. And um, I like to, and I like to have a plan for all, all phases because yeah, I've had plenty of times where like, you know, you, you, you see like you're, you know, it's on a major label. They're putting a ton of money into it. They, they have the biggest writer and producer in the world on it. And it just, it just didn't work. <laughs> like, yeah. And it's, and it's not anybody's fault. Like the producer did their best. The marketing t- team did their best everyone did their job and everyone was passionate about it, but it just didn't, it didn't get received by the public for whatever reason. Um, Mm -hmm. It happens. It's a mystery. That's the, I think that's one of the things I love and at the same time get frustrated with about being a musician and having a music career. It's like, sometimes you do everything right and it doesn't land. Sometimes you think uh, we did what we could and it's a huge hit, (laughs) you know, it's like, yeah, it's, 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 you never know. You never know. Yeah. What, what, uh, you know, as far as like going through the creative process, what tips do you have for artists as far as like even just capturing some of the, the pieces or things that could potentially become content when they're doing it? Like, what are some things that you might remind an artist like, Hey, think about these things. Um, Cause that to me, I think is oftentimes the stressful part. It's like you're in the studio or you're writing, you're recording, you're in the creation process and then when you're all done, you're like, dang it, I wish we had this, 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 and this, and we can't go back and get it. Yeah. Um, I think that the best way, and listen, there's no right way to do it. There's moments that I miss because I feel like it would be not appropriate to take out a phone at that moment. And I don't know, you feel, because what always has to come first is the art, the music, the, you know, or the music video, whatever it is. Like, I, I think social media content always comes secondary to that. And yeah, sometimes you wish you caught stuff in the moment but i would rather the moment have happened and not caught it than you know may possibly messed up the moment by Mm -hmm. thinking about it for social media because again i think social media can mess up a lot of good things sometimes um but you know something i i like to you know encourage my clients to do or or sometimes we'll schedule ourselves to do this is basically allocate time for social media like sometimes we'll actually go into the studio before somebody starts for the day and just knock out some, some content in that sense before like they've gotten too far down the, uh, you know, the rabbit hole or like, let's say they have a three day sort of like mini writing camp. Maybe we go in at the end, listen to the songs with them, get some shots then, but it's almost kind of, you don't want sometimes going in in the middle can be sort of disruptive. Yeah. So I like to, I like to think, you know, again, planning, I think can, really help in a lot of these situations, but maybe sort of stack some time on the front end or the end of it. Um, or if you're comfortable with it and have the budget, like just have somebody there who's non-intrusive, just getting it the whole time, um, who isn't a part of the team so that you don't have to, again, doing both jobs can be really tough, like being the producer or being the artist or the writer and also thinking about the content. You know, if you're inspired, do it, go for it, don't do it. But if it's, you know, if it's nagging at you, it, it, figuring out, a, another person that you're comfortable with being there who isn't going to disrupt the artistry but can be you know the term fly on a wall i mm-hmm. think that can be a, a way to you know help with that as well i think kevin is well versed in being the um resident <laughs> social media pest in his yeah. band of like I, uh, all right I guys show, get the camera out <laughs> i show up to the studio with like five cameras and video equipment and forget all my gear at home uh no but it is stressful because i'll be like we'll be having a moment and I'll be like looking around the room, someone please take out a camera and, and capture this because, or I get angry because someone will be there and they'll start videoing when the boring stuff starts. And when the good stuff starts, like they get involved, like interested. So they turn the phone off and they're just like 
on the edge of their seat. What are they going to, they're arguing. What are they going to argue about? I'm like, film the argument. That's what I want to see. <laughs> yeah. I want to see all the good stuff. Um, you, you mentioned something just a minute ago that, that I was curious about. You mentioned the idea of like not wanting to over market it. And there was, uh, I, I'm curious to get your take on what that is or how an artist might know when they're crossing the line, because I, I saw, it was like Instagram just served up this artist to me in my feed and I started following it because I thought this might be too much. This might be too much, but it, it was working for her. And so I know things are gonna be different for every person, but I felt my initial take was like, mm, I think you're crossing a line that's going to have diminishing returns, but yeah, I was wrong big time. But what, what are your, what are your thoughts on that? Cause I think a lot of us struggle with that when we like, we don't want to come off as salespeople. Yeah. And if you, feel and listen it's my line for for this is or the example i always use is you want to you don't want to like be you know a sales person but you also have to think about it this way if something good is happening in your career your family would want to know about it and they would be mad at you if you didn't tell them like oh i have this song coming out or I release new merchandise or I'm going on tour. I'm going to be in town where you are. Like people that you care about in real life would be upset if you withheld that information from them. So the people who follow you, they follow you because they do want information about you. They do want to know the things going on in your life. And I think it's finding that balance between like humbly sharing those things happening in your life, but not like forcing them to care about it. And that can be, I think, you know, that's a line where a lot of people are figuring yeah. out right now. Um, I, I find myself in this weird spot when I, what did you call it? In the sustained phase of the mm -hmm. post release where reviews are coming in, playlists, placements, you know, and I'm like, well, I think for one, I have a duty to share this for the playlisters sake to give them some thanks and share link. I want to brag, of course. And at the same time, I assume no one will care. And then I'm like, wait, who is this for? Is it for the playlister or the, the, the blogger? Is it for me to be like, see, I'm a real musician. And, Cause it doesn't feel when I do that, it doesn't feel like it's for the audience necessarily. Does that, I don't, I don't even know if that's a question. I'm just admitting. No, no that, <laughs> no, that makes sense. Yeah. But I think it, yeah. Knowing why you're sharing something can be important. Are you sharing it for attention? Or are you sharing it because you think people that care about you would want to know, or are you sharing it because you want, to help other people or cause you want to, you know, thank somebody. And I think that doing things, you know, people, and it can be a mix of those things, but I think doing something solely for attention without the upside of one of the other ones is a, a situation that we should try to avoid. Like if you're posting that you're in a private plane, just because you want to look cool. That doesn't really make people feel good about themselves. Like what, what is, you know, but if you, but if you post that you're in a private plane and you're like grateful because you, you've never been, and this is like a cool experience and you've always dreamed about it, you know, that, that can be a little more humbling. It's just all about framing and thinking about why you're sharing something. Um, but if, but, point, but if yeah. you don't want, if, if you're sharing stuff that's, to make you look good and to make other people feel bad. I think that's when maybe you shouldn't press. Oh, the it's button. never to make anyone else feel bad. It's no, definitely I know. To make you feel good. <laughs> Chris is no. always in private jets. And so we're, we're used to it now. But I just, I always use that as an example. Cause I'm like, okay, but why are you posting this? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, and, and there can be, there can be good reasons for posting that kind yeah, of photo. People want to saying, celebrate your successes. Yeah. But I think just like being like, if you posted like another day and I'm like, eh, if it's another day, then why are we Another day, posting? another playlist. <laughs> <laughs> no, but playlists are, are good because I mean, there's, there's a lot of upsides, I think, to, you know, sharing playlists. One, I think the people who are closest to you will definitely want to celebrate with you. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's an upside. I think thanking the platform and editors, I think that's an upside and a, a nice thing to do. Um, and just in general, letting I think letting people know about music and playlists that exist, I think is important too. I think sharing music is important, like regardless of if it's your own or not. Hmm. Sharing music with people is is you know is everything with with music. It can be a really great gift to give to your friends and people that follow you. 
That's true. It's a whole lot better use of our time than trolling people online. So, okay, I won't feel yeah. bad. <laughs> <laughs> well, we should probably uh, wrap up soon. Chris, do you have any final questions or? Nothing specific. Do you have? Um, well, uh, Cassie, where, where can people find out more about you? I mean, you've been very generous with your time already. Um, where can people find out more about you and what your company does and, and, and all that? So uh, I'm most active on LinkedIn and Instagram, and I'm at Cassie, C-A-S-S-I-E, Petrie, P-E-T-R-E-Y. Uh, there's not really a lot about my company, CrowdSurf Online, that is by design. Um, but if you follow me, I, you know, I'm sharing some of the stuff that we're doing there and just in general posting some thoughts about the music industry and, and digital marketing and always down to chat and DMs. Excellent. Cool. Yeah. Thanks cool. so much for coming on. Yeah. Here. Yeah. Of course. Thank, thank you, you for so having much. me. Yeah. All right. Well, that that's going to do it with our interview with Cassie. There was a lot of great, great uh, nuggets of information in there. I, I was taking notes and, um, and, and, uh, the nugget I'll take away from that is, um, we're all terrified. We're all bad. <laughs> there's, which is there. That just means there's endless room for growth. That's right. That's <laughs> right. Uh, one of the things, uh, that I, that I wrote down that I thought was incredibly important because I know all artists struggle with marketing themselves and such, but she said, if something good is happening in your career, your family would want to know about it. And they'd be mad if you withheld that information. So the people that chose to follow you would want to know that information as well. That's a good reminder. It's a good reminder. Good reminder. Speaking of reminders, uh, we should remind oh, people go ahead. about uh, this thing, the DIY Musician VIP Experience happening in Nashville. Uh, let's see. It's May 18th to May 20th. Hope you'll join us. Yeah, check that out. I'll be there. Chris will be there. It's going to be a great time to connect. And if you're still watching on YouTube, our social handles are on the screen. I'm at K Bruner. That's K B R E U N E R. And Chris is at Chris Robley. We'd love to connect with you. We've got lots of little projects and things we're doing. And uh, check out the link in bio. You might find some some fun stuff that uh, yeah you can sign up for. So check you're, it out. You're, you're describing it like a like an Easter egg. <laughs> so Easter, Easter, Easter is coming up, Chris. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, yeah. So, all right. Well, uh, that's going to do it for this episode, and we'll catch you next time. See ya.